I know that I got to take what I'm doing to the next level. I got, I got, I got my DNA. The stuff that I was trying to do, I needed another mentor. And one of the goals was to meet Bishop Jakes. Mm -hmm. You've been praying and asking God to meet me. I said, sir, ever since I was 14 years old. You don't want to be a pastor. You want to be famous. Someone asked me to look at this interview between Keon Henderson and Cam Newton. Both of these men are all over the place. The difference is, though, one is a pastor, one is not. And when you listen to the interview, you're going to find some things that are pretty striking, pretty telling. And it's just an, an indication that he should not be a pastor. His goal is not the gospel. His goal seems to be fame. His goal seems to be kind of building his brand, becoming wealthy, becoming well known. And we're just going to listen to his words. And you're going to see this too often in pastors over and over and over again in America. Too many pastors have this quality to where they want to be known. They want to be recognized. It's about branding. It's about their image. I got to get this book. Deal done. I got to get this conference. I got to go over here. I got to do that. I want folks to see me. I want to be everywhere. So they're going out all over the place, forgetting about the fact that you're a shepherd. When you as the shepherd are gone, Who's tending to the flock? So let's listen to something that he says, a few things that he says, and it's pretty telling. These are his words, and all it does is verify what we've thought about him, or at least what I thought about him for so long. By the time we finished canceling and criticizing all of the people who got the courage to stand up and speak a truth, ain't nobody going to be left because it's so dangerous to be a voice in this day and time that even people with information refuse to speak. So what he's saying right here are there are times where someone might say something and people get ostracized. I, and I understand that the body can sometimes be a little bit too harsh, a little too critical. That just kind of goes with territory. And it's not just Christians. It's everybody. Everybody has an opinion. So it's no surprise that even Christians have an opinion. But the reason why he's making this statement is he's making an excuse for something. And I'm not saying that he's uh, in violation uh, or this precludes him from being a pastor. It might, especially in the eyes of some, but what he does with it, he never deals with it. He just kind of makes excuses or it really glosses over the issue. And he's going to talk about it in a second. It's hard out here. You fill in the blank because it's like, all right, I know what the truth is mm -hmm. about me. If I got up and told that truth, it's going to be a certain section of society that says, man, I rock with him. So here's the truth about me. I got a divorce. I'm a preacher, I'm a pastor, but God hate divorce. So it's a group saying, man, thank you for your testimony, bro. Thank you because now I see that there's room for me at the cross. Mm -hmm. Now I know that God can love anybody. Then you got the other group. That ain't of God. That ain't of God. It's now, there's some truth and there's some deception here. There are gonna be those that no matter what your background is, that they're gonna say, you know what, you're going to hell, that's, that's not of God. And there are those that are, as he says that, you know what, I can rock that. And there's room for me at the altar. Well, no, whoa, 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 not quite. There's room for you at the altar if you are repentant of those things. Whatever it is in the past, you can't just, there's this old saying, come as you are. No, not come as you are unrepentant. Don't come any old way. You cannot come before the Lord expecting salvation and wanting to hold on to your sin, to, not to deny it. What he doesn't do is he never really did. Matter of fact, he doesn't deal with the question here. It's almost so he's making excuses or glossing over. Let's get past it. Yeah, it happened, but and so what? Let's move on. You can't do that. You can't come to the altar. There's no room for anyone at the altar who is unrepentant. Anyone that comes to the altar who's unrepentant is going to be left behind. Or as they say in marriage, you'll be left at the altar. That's what's going to happen. And that's what he's teaching people. Live how you want to live. It's okay. God's going to forgive. But there's something a little bit more to that. Does God forgive? Sure. You've got to ask for forgiveness. And that that's basically what salvation is. You are asking the Lord to forgive you of these deeds, but you have to recognize these deeds. He doesn't want to seem to recognize these deeds. And the irony is he's speaking about a book right to the left of him called Lazy Love. Uh, it's kind of hard to speak to a, have a person who has been divorced twice, married a person who's been divorced twice, and this is both you all's third marriage, and you're you're teaching people how to have a healthy marriage and you're not really publicly dealing with these other marriages. That's the kind of person that you probably don't really want to hear advice from. Maybe they're having a good marriage. Who knows? 
but I'm not listening to you. Well, I can tell you how how to not um, be successful. I can tell you what I what my failures were. Yeah, it's just not genuine coming from you. It's an abolishment. Well, well, it's easy for you to judge the thing that you ain't done yet. Mm. But it's some stuff that you do that ain't of God either. But here's what people do with sin. They're only outraged about the sin that they haven't done yet. Mm. Ooh, that's the only thing. Now, there's some truth to that. But again, you're still deflecting. Deal with the issue with the divorces. And someone will say, wait a second. Maybe after one marriage, you made a mistake. But then here's a second one. And now you're on the third one. And so what sort of person are you? Well, he's going to tell you what sort of person he is. But again, no one complains about or, or people are only outraged about the mistakes that they don't make. There's some truth to that. But at the same time, can you, at least as the pastor, show, give an example of how we ought to all feel outraged and bothered by sin, my sin, your sin, all sin? He's saying that matters. Hey, that's, hey, that's. I started preaching at 14. Mm -hmm. I was that, that little kid preaching. One of the things my father pastor told me, he said, now, don't get up here talking about no relationships and talking about no, uh, you, you know, uh, husbands and wives. He told me everything. He said, you ain't done nothing. Yes. So what is the young person to preach? The Bible. Yes. So my first sermon was called Faith, Where is Yours? Mm. And I was talking about Peter walking on the water because when you don't, when you haven't lived it, it's difficult for your story to be transformational. Extremely it difficult. It is. And then we, and we end up emulating and, 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 you know, and we all, we all kind of do it. So what he's going to, what he's speaking about is, well, you can't really help anyone unless you've gone through something. You can't, if I've gone through these divorces and these struggles, so I can't help you uh, if I hadn't gone through anything. That's not true at all. You don't have to have gone through divorces or have uh, been on drugs to help someone who's in drugs. You don't have to go through all these things to help someone to leave them now. Can someone who's been in that situation speak to them a little bit better, a little clearer? Sure. But that means that you would have to go through all the different sins there are out there to speak to someone. That is not the case at all. What it is, is you are minimizing your sin. You're minimizing what you've done. Say, so, well, this is how God is going to use me. It's, it's, it's excuses that you're making just so that you don't appear to look bad before the people, appear to look indecisive, appear to look like you can't really um, have a strong commitment, that you can't really manage your household. That's one of the qualifications. And at least twice so far, you have failed to manage your household. And you did so the other two times as a preacher. And so not being able to manage the household, your household, you have to be able to manage the household of God. And that's a reflection of it. Well, so therein lies a problem. And so all he's doing is making excuses. And so this is what God wants to use for me. This is how God is using me because I've gone through those things. And so I can help you guys to better navigate the landscape. That's not biblical at all. Uh-huh. He's feeling you. Uh-huh. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. Don't be no tough guy. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. Now, he's going to start speaking about his relationship with T.D. Jakes. The reason why we know of Keon Henderson is because of T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes is not someone that you ought to emulate, but I do understand that a lot of people do. T.D. Jakes, for the bulk of the 90s, was someone that people looked up, especially a lot of black preachers, looked up to. They wanted to be like him. Why? They liked the audience. They liked the people cheering. He did say some things. He was charismatic in his approach and his speaking. He said some things that would kind of speak to you, some things that are truthful, but wrapped up in bad doctrine. And, and he would use these words that would kind of just tickle the ears and make folks cheer. Again, forgetting about the fact that he may have misused the, the Bible. And so we know about Keon Henderson because of T.D. Jakes. You talked about your relationship with T.D. Jakes. How did that manifest and in, in how, how has he been an asset in your life? Man, so, wow, man, probably 15 years ago, I'm in Orlando, Florida. Mm -hmm. I was in Jay Alexander restaurant and I had attended one of his conferences. He ain't know me. I only knew of him. I'm in the restaurant. I get up to walk out and Bishop Jakes says, hey, somebody stop that young man. I can still hear his voice. He had a white suit on, red tie. Hey. Yeah, like he's, somebody stop that man. And his, his, um, one of his assistants came over and said, hey, the bishop wants to see you. Now, the whole time I've been staring at him at the table, because it was him. Now, according to what he's saying, the whole time I've been staring at him at the table. This is the problem with a lot of preachers. They see someone else, uh, especially younger 
preacher seeing an older preacher, a more famous preacher, and what do they do? They want to emulate that person. They want to, as he's telling us, he wants to be great like him. And this reminds us of Simon the Sorcerer. You remember Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8. He says there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, which is what Keon wants to do as well, claiming to be someone great. This is not them claiming to be great, him great. This is himself. Uh, the Greek tells us that it's, it's him, Simon, who wants to be great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. You all know the story as it goes on, that Peter shows up, Peter and John show up, and they receive, the Samaritans receive the Holy Spirit. And what does Keon, I mean, what does Simon want? Simon wants that same power. Simon wants the same thing and even offers to buy it. What can I do to have this power? And what is Peter's response? Pray that the Lord forgives you. Your silver uh, will perish with you. And so we see the same thing happening. You just really want to be great. You're in these places. You try to be around people, networking, hobnobbing, rubbing shoulders with people because hopefully that can kind of get you in. It was him and a whole lot of other major preachers at that time just having dinner after a conference. He comes up to me and he says, you've been praying and asking God to meet me. I said, sir, ever since I was 14 years old, I had him. Well, that's evident, that's obvious. You're sitting there staring at the man in, in the restaurant. And so, yeah, that that's obvious. I'm pretty sure he gets that all the time. I told you guys about a conversation, not a conversation, but a, one of the meetings that I had. This was at my time as uh, an investment advisor. And this was, I, at the time I was with Edward Jones and I had an office uh, and in this building, I had a client on the fourth floor, which is where T.D. Jakes had his, I think this Metroplex Economic Development Corporation, I think that's what it was called. Well, I had a client, actually I had two clients that worked in that actual office. And so I was up there speaking to one of them. And, you know, you would you'd have an occasion to see T.D. Jakes from, from time to time walking through and so forth. No big deal. And so as I was leaving, I had to get back downstairs to my office. I had an appointment showing up. And he, with his entourage, I think there were maybe three or four people with him. Two of them definitely were security. And so there are two elevators and I'm getting on. Uh, we push the button and the elevator shows up and they want me to wait. No, can you catch the next elevator? No, you can catch the next elevator. I've got an appointment to get to. And just to look on his face, the audacity that I had to ride in the elevator with him when his security or his people said, no, can you just ride by? Why Why do I, why can't I ride with you? We walk down the same hall together. We're standing in the same foyer together. Why can't I? And that's the kind of attitude that you, that I, now maybe this just, I've got a bad impression, but every time that I had an occasion to be around him, that was what I saw because people have told him, made him feel that way. Now, this was in 19... 99, maybe 98, 99. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Imagine now it's 25 years later and has that feeling gotten any better? Well, no, he still likes to hobnob around uh, famous folks, being around famous people uh, because he's famous, because he's somebody and other folks want to be around him. And so it's hard to imagine that that particular attitude that he had then is any different. So I can understand that he's probably looking at Keon thinking, yeah, he wants to be like me. He, he's been watching me. He's been thinking about me a book in my book bag where I had always wrote my, my goals down. And one of the goals was to meet Bishop Jakes. Mm -hmm. I still got the book to this day. So, By the way, how was that a goal to meet? I, my goal as a preacher, now he was a preacher at the time. My goal is to meet T.D. Jakes. I could personally, I could care less who I meet. I've met some people uh, in my lifetime, some famous people, and I really, I, I do not care about it. I never cared really to meet, well, then as a boy I did. As a boy, I wanted to meet Michael Jackson. As a boy, I wanted to meet this person. As a boy, I, I wanted to meet my favorite quarterback uh, at the time was I wanted to meet Dan Fouts. I wanted to meet Joe Montana. I got to meet them because I took, I think I told you, Eric Dickerson was my cousin or is my cousin. Uh, so I got to meet a lot of different people uh, in the NFL and, and basketball and, and, and some, some famous people as well. Never did anything to me. Now, as you get older and you're a preacher, your goal is to meet another preacher I want to meet that preacher. I want to meet that preacher. No, I want to meet Jesus. How about that? And I want some other people to meet Jesus because of what I'm doing. So he said, hey, man, um, you know, I'll deal with you. He said, I'll help you learn how to preach. I feel a connection. That same thing you talked about that a father and son has, that 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 draw. Like, I knew he had something that I had because now. Now, think about what he's saying, because what you're not seeing is him being told or saying, I want to learn the word like you learn. I want to desire to break apart the word. No, I want I want people to hear me 
and then I want the reaction from the crowd that you get. I want to be seen. Now, who does that? Well, Jesus addressed these people. He called, these are the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, verse 5, it says, But they, the Pharisees, do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels. This is the clothing that they wear uh, of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets. They love to have entourages and security guard walking with them and the chief seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by man but do not be called rabbi for one is your teacher and and you are all brother and what he's his point is don't try to let someone call you that way mr jakes don't let folks look at you, look up to you like that put make sure that they put you in your proper perspective that you are just as bad as they are you just may have to be more noticed but you're because it causes other folks like Keon to see and they look at you and they want to be you and, and they don't see a humble you. I know that I got to take what I'm doing to the next level. And my father at best was a local pastor. He never did anything nationally. He never wrote any books that he published. You know what I'm saying? Right. The stuff that I was trying to do, I needed another mentor because I think that for every task, you need a teacher. Mm. So I the thing about what he said, um, I've never been to that level. I want to get to that level. My father, oh, he's never wrote any, any books on that level or done anything on that level. And so I need someone to get me to that level. Enter T.D. Jakes. So I brought on another task. I found me a sage, a teacher. He said, I'll deal with you, but don't waste my time. His exact words. He said, give me a call. I'm excited, man. I got home. I told my mom. I'm like, man, mom, I met Bishop Jakes in the restaurant. And uh, he told me to call him. She said, well, have you called him? I said, oh, man. He ain't even give me his phone number. <laughs> gotcha. Got him. <laughs> Got him. But he shouldn't have challenged me because I found him anyway. Mm. There's a dude named Curtis Wallace, who was his producer of his movie Sparkle and his lawyer at the time. I knew him. And I called him. And I said, hey, man, I met Bishop Jakes in the restaurant. He told me to call him. This is what he had on. This is what I had on. He said, all right, let me try. Because he Now, there is a little bit of a lesson there. People who are trying to do things will always or should always find out people who are actually doing things. And that's what happens here. Now, the issue is what are the things that you're trying to do? As a pastor, the things you're trying to do is to be successful as, at a pastor. Your goal is, notice what his goals aren't. His goals aren't about how do I get the people in my church to grow in the Lord? How do I get them to learn the scriptures even better? How do I get them to, to emulate that in their jobs, in their home, with their families, in school? Th those are never the conversations that he's speaking of. He just wants to be at a high level. Can you see why he, his whole ministry, by his own words, are fraudulent? It's all about him. And again, when you watch his, we've done this before, when you go to his Instagram and so forth, it's all about showing some sort of celebrity walk, posing, going for interviews, doing these different things. Nothing about God. It's always about promoting himself or his wife or what they're doing. That's it. Who does that? What shepherd does that? None. He ain't believe me. No. Bishop gives him his email address to give to me. He didn't give me his phone number, he gave me his email address. And he emailed me one day and he said, now at the time he emails me, I'm in Dallas, Texas at the Hilton Anatol, listening to a man at a network marketing convention say these exact words. I'm looking at your camera, he said, I make a million dollars a month. And if you don't make a million dollars a month, then you don't need to be talking when I'm talking. If you now, I've seen those sort of meetings. As a matter of fact, I've been in those sort of meetings before. And, and this is when I was I was young, wanting to get rich, wanting to be something. I wanted, to, I wanted a million dollars coming in a week, that kind of thing. We all seen those things. You stay up late at night and you see those little infomercials that come on. You get invited or you go to these different shows. This is where he's at. Well, there's a problem, especially now remember, he's a pastor at the time. He's a preacher. What does Paul says, speaking of Timothy, who's also training others to be a preacher to be pastors to be elders he says but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction why for the love of money you at a conference where you want to get rich think about it you want to get rich so bad that you'll pay money to go hear someone else who is rich or we think they're rich telling you how to get rich for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Wandered away from the faith, remember that's the noun, 
wandered away from the tenets of the faith, what we believe, what we think, what we ought to be practicing and preaching, which is why the members of his church don't really get that. And so that says a whole lot. He is, he, I, I guess he doesn't realize how much he's telling on himself. If you got to use the bathroom, don't go to the bathroom. I don't care what you do. You need to sit down and listen to me if you don't have what I have. He's saying that. And I get an email from Bishop Jakes that says, what's your phone number? I sent my phone number to him and my phone is ringing while he's saying that. Mm. Blah. So I'm like, I got a decision to make. I know who calling me, bro. Man, I got up and walked out right while he was talking, bro. I walked outside. It was 160 degrees in Dallas. I walked outside in a blue suit, sweating. He said, this is T.D. Jakes. Excited. Excited. Would I, would, could I have been in that position and taken a phone call from someone that I looked up to? Yeah, um, but thankfully, I've grown a lot since then. Thankfully, that's not, if you call me, um, you're probably not going to get uh, an answer. You're probably going to have to wait, even no matter how much I look up to you or because I don't really look up to you. But no matter how much I respect you, no matter how much I think about you, whoever it is, the likelihood of me taking a call at that moment, especially if it's not a, a number that I know of. Um, sorry, I'll get back with you. But then again, he's at a place desperate looking to come up in the world. And so when T.D. Jakes calls, I, I understand he takes, a, he takes a phone call because that's his way up. I just listened to five of your sermons on YouTube. You are an Olympic swimmer in shallow water. So mm. you got the skill, but you ain't deep. He said, if I was preaching this, this is what I would have did. And for 30 minutes, he preached my sermon back to me. And bro, tears are coming down my eyes because somebody that I looked up to is acknowledging your is acknowledge word. See, he did what I've been looking for all them years that I just finished complaining about. Yeah. Now I got it. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to rock with him. Now, remember, listen to how he's saying this. And by the way, the earlier part of what I just read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse 9 and 10, let's go to verse 5. Verse 5 says, And constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Who suppose that godliness, that's the way that I'm going to gain. Not realizing, as he says in verse 6, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. In other words, godliness, that is the gain. That's what we're looking for. And so he figures that doing this, this is the stepping stool. This is the tool that's going to launch me into me becoming the best me. And who's he talking to? Someone else who's done the exact same thing. Someone else uh, who can show you. Someone else who's trying to leave a legacy, by the way, of other people that he can say, I, I birthed this person. I birthed that person, that person, that person. I've got little, little Jake's all over the place, little legacies. But now, ultimately behind all of them is the true father of lies and deception. And just like his other friend down in Houston, who is also looking for the best you, you know, uh, smiling Joel, this is what they're after. They're after branding themselves and they're using the Bible. They're using the church to do so. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible speaks about people who will exploit you, uh, people who would uh, use you or you, treat you as merchandise. He says, and in their greed, they will exploit you with their false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. These are people that will use you as merchandise. You are a means to where they're trying to go to. Yeah. What they, what they say in, the, in, in, in ministry, that better be God calling you on your cell phone. <laughs> if it ain't. It is. <laughs> this is. This is for real. This is for real. Yeah, man. So he preached my sermons back to me. We got a father-son relationship going. And man, the amount of information that that man has poured into me, not just about the Bible. He was there when I closed my biggest real estate deal. So he's poured into him and most of it is not doctrine. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about how, how his doctrine has seeped over into Keon as well. But the majority is how you build your brand up, how you build yourself, how you do things. If you watch Keon, you watch his approach, how he moves his mannerisms on the words. It's the same way. Remember, he just told us that T.D. Jakes um, took some of his sermons and preached them back to him. This is how I would have said it. This is what I really. The Bible says you have many teachers, but not many fathers. There is a difference in the sound of a father than a teacher. Now, I understand taking taking tips from people, what you ought to say, not to say whatever, but not to emulate that person. I have a way if when I'm at now, if I'm a preaching and I'm at, I'm at someone else's church, I'm going to do it differently, a little bit differently because I understand the audience and so forth. But I, and I get that. I, I, I get that. 
but me naturally. And, and truth be told, even when I'm at someone else's church, I'm still going to kind of do it mainly me. I mean, it's just me. And so I'm going to be personable. Um, I am going to, you know, exhibit some emotion that we might laugh. We might cry. We, we're definitely going to think and we're going through the scriptures. Why? Because the most important thing that needs to be highlighted isn't me. It's the word of God that then highlights Jesus, you know, the real celebrity, the real goat, the greatest of all time, the scapegoat, the one who bore our sins, the one who died on the cross and paid the sins. He's the true celebrity. He's the one who the light should be shed on. But when I start thinking about what God has done for me. If we're going to put anything on Instagram about us, somebody walking into the building, how about him walking up the road, up the hill, carrying the cross? Let's highlight that. Let's not highlight me getting out of a fancy car. No, my new ride, my, my new whip, my new ride. Let's not highlight me riding in my whip. How about we highlight Christ riding on a colt on his way to then be crucified a week later? How about we highlight that? That is not what Keon is after. Keon is after himself. Him, his wife, their success, their book deals, and so for you buying it, all the, in these different campaigns, give money. Uh, the Lord wants to bless us and wants to use you, and then by using you to bless us, he's going to bless you. It's the same old tried, um, tired little routine that too many people fall for because they see someone, I want to be like him. I want to be like her. Well, do what they did. That's not true either. As a matter of fact, you might, you, do, you can do what they did. And then end up getting the same punishment that they are due to get. And you're going to realize at some point in time, it wasn't worth it. I hope you don't realize it wasn't worth it while you're in hell. I hope that's the case. But going back to Keon, as he says that he likes to emulate T.D. Jakes and even take some of the things that he's, that he's teaching. One of the things that he's teaching is his flawed interpretation or understanding and teaching of the Trinity. Who the identity that of this God of ours just like T.D. Jakes. You know, T.D. Jakes is known for being a oneness, known for being a modalist, and he tries to sugarcoat it. No, it's not that big a deal. Yeah, it is. And listen to how Keon also describes the Trinity. We're not a polytheistic people. Poly meaning many. Polygraph, many lives. We are a monotheistic people. Mono, one. We got one Lord. That's why there's no way to the Father except by him. Now, I know it sounds polytheistic because there was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the three are one. He is not three gods. He is one God acting in three different persons. So when he created the world, he was Father. When he raised us from the dead, he was Son. And now he's walking with us as the Holy Ghost, but all three are one. He's at the right hand of the Father, yet he is the Father. Yet he's in this room, and yet he's everywhere at the same time. No, 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 and no. I should have just said it three times, just just to be uh, my trinity of no's. No, no, sir. One, he's not the father. He didn't become this and then become that and then become this and then become that. No, he's always been the father. He's always been this. Remember, the Bible tells us that the father has always been loving and he's always been loving the son. Jesus himself says that you have loved me even before the foundation of the world. So the father has always been the father loving the son. Now, is the son to us like a father or fatherly according to Isaiah 9? Sure. But is he the father? No, he's not. And I know it can be complicated and confusing some people, but the pastor, if he's going to preach that, he ought to know those things. And so it's another example of him being just like his teacher, his mentor, T.D. Jakes. This is the reason why you should not listen, not, be, not just for the bad teaching. By the way, the Bible says this, that if anyone aspires to this office of overseer, it's a fine desire. It's a wonderful work that you're doing, but he has to be above reproach. Too many things are being named about Keon and folks are finding it hard to actually listen to him. If if when I listen to the gospel, I can't hear the gospel. I just I, I, I'm only focused on your past or who you are or your or your current situation that reminds me of your past. That's an issue. Uh, then he must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, <laughs> temperate, prudent, respectable. There we go. Hospitable, able to teach, certainly not able to teach. And again, his whole focus is, as he says, the love of money or love of himself. He says must be free from the love of money. He's not. It doesn't seem like that. And we see that in, in so many times in the things that he's saying, lies that he's been caught up in. The Lord told me to ask for this money to build or expand on our church. But we find out that it was T.D. Jakes who told us that the Lord or that he told 
Keon to ask for this money or this hurricane that hit in Houston is an opportunity. But Keon said it was a Lord. And then there's these different lies, these misstatements about the insurance and things like that. And the Lord said in 21 days, we're going to have this money. And lo and behold, it's it's not 21 days now. We're working on uh, several weeks after the fact. That's just not what a pastor should be like. He's not pastoral material. He's not. As a matter of fact, what does the Bible say? The Bible says in Hebrews, now this doesn't apply to just pastors. It applies to all of us, but certainly to a pastor. He says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. Is Keon Henderson content with just being just a decent human being and a pastor? No. Want to go to the next level because as he says, my father, uh, he hadn't wrote any great books or well-known, nationally known, anything like that. And so I want to be with someone who does that. Uh, no, he's not content. Be Being content with what you have for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. He's not content with that. He doesn't seem to be very content with that, even by his own words. As a believer, if you you must be content with that. The fact that Jesus is your savior. The fact that he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. You need to be content when Jesus, when the 70 come back, they are happy and astonished that even the demons are subject to them. And he says, don't be, don't be excited about that. Be excited about your names being written in the book of life, that your names are written. Because if you're excited more about the demons than you are about the, about the, uh, your name, well, then you're not saved. Your name isn't written there. So, you need to be grateful, more grateful about what Christ has done than what some celebrity can do. You need to be more enamored with him and his word than the world. Don't be like the world. That is a command. If you are, you are going to join the world in hell. And I pray and hope that that's not Keon, but it seems to be the case. And I would say to you all that listen to him, don't get caught up in that because I can promise you the fall is worse than you can imagine been there. The pain, uh, the grief that you cause, the regret. The only problem is it's one thing to be in prison and have regrets. It's one thing to be in a hospital and have regrets. It's one thing to be at a job or someplace else and have regrets. It's a far worse thing to be in hell and have regrets. Silence. Silence in the name of Jesus.